All right, very good. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Excellent. So again, my name is Sean O'Connor. A uh, little bit of a long title, um, but we're going to get into talking about predictive maintenance, right? Asset condition monitoring. And the conversations that we need to have around this. So a little bit about me. Uh, again, United States Marine, that's where I cut my teeth in the maintenance world. Um, I then became a consultant with Mistras Group, uh, a lot of oil and gas. Um, I collected vibration data for about eight years, almost every single day. Um, so I know the pains of, you know, try to put in a work order that never gets done. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that. Uh, and then I moved on to the world of Bristol Myers Squibb, CMRP, CRL. Uh, now I'm a site operations manager focused on uh, facility operations. So asset condition monitoring, predictive maintenance, whatever we want to call it. Uh, we're talking about the green boxes of the uptime elements. And the green boxes on this chart are probably not unfamiliar with the people that are in the room. Um, so we're talking about vibration, infrared, ultrasonics, oil samples, non-destructive testing, alignment and balancing, all that stuff. Now, if you want to go out and collect data, and you want to go out and analyze this data, there's world-class training programs that can get you to be the best in the world, right? You go to Tech Associates of Charlotte, Vibration Institute, Infrospection, and they'll take you as far as you want to go in collecting and analyzing that data, right? But all that results to is a recommendation. All that gives you is a recommendation, and depending on where you are in your organization, that may or may not have a lot of weight behind it, right? But having conversations and going through what we're going to talk to you about today will help bolster what that recommendation gives you, right? Because what we want to do is convert that recommendation to action. Action is the only thing that matters. Actually getting things fixed and getting things, you know, in a better state, the state that they were designed for, is what we want. And largely we have to have conversations to make that happen. Right? I wish it was as simple as entering a work order, putting in the right language, it gets planned, scheduled, and executed. How often does that happen? Probably not all that often, right? So we need to have these conversations. We need to go outside of our comfort zone, and it's integral to program success. And as we find, as we jump into the internet of things, a very new world to a lot of us, some we may or may not understand, having conversations outside of these comfort zones is going to be integral to that success. It's going to become such a necessity. I'm working on an IoT project now. 85% of it has just been talk. 85% of it has just been meetings. We put very little into practice because it's knowledge, right? We have to educate procurement. We have to educate the site directors. We need to educate all these people on what we're trying to do so that we can ultimately find things before they fail. Right? Because what we need to do is get that recommendation, get that data to the right people. Right? The right data to the right people. And what I've done is I've outlined four key groups of the people that we need to deliver value to, take value from, mentor, and eventually monetize what we're doing. All around these conversations. So we're going to be talking to the shop floor to management, to finance, to IT. You know, these are not groups that we may necessarily deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, there may even be levels between us and the shop floor. We're not actually talking to those guys, right? And we need to change that up. So there's very little about this talk this morning that deals with the technical aspect of vibration analysis or infrared. Um, it's really just a conduit that we're going to use to talk about communication, right? So we can't think like a maintenance manager, a plant manager, a uh, lead technician or anything like that. We need to think like marketers, right? We need to market what we have the ability to do for our organization from a maintenance and reliability standpoint. So John Cotter, Harvard Business School, guru in change management, says great communicators have an appreciation for positioning. They understand the people they're trying to reach and what they can and can't hear. They send their message through an open door rather than trying to push it through a wall. If it was as easy as writing an SOP, 
and having everyone follow it, then we wouldn't even have these conferences. We would just write SOPs and things would just happen naturally. But we know that's not the case. There's a human element to this that we really need to think about. The words we say, how they're received, how they're heard. Right, so managing a asset condition monitoring program is no different. Right, you pick up something on a vibration report. As you work that defect through your process, whether you're talking to the shop floor, management, IT, finance, it's going to be the same uh, goal. Right? You want to get it fixed, but you're going to give a little different piece of the conversation to each group as you're trying to work that through. So the shop floor. Right? The value that we receive from the shop floor, straight talk. I was talking to one of the guys at my table, and I said, I'm not sure if this talk is going to go over well or not. He said, well, it's all maintenance guys. They'll let you know, right? Our maintenance guys, our shop floor, they're going to let us know. They're going to give us the straight talk, right? And they have decades of trial and error. So when we start to introduce predictive technologies, we are not telling them how to do their job, right? We may say, hey, you know what works. Maybe you don't necessarily uh, know why it works or can't explain exactly how it works, but you know what works and what doesn't work. So we need to take that and we need to receive that value. The value that we return to them is that we listen to them, right? We want to solicit their advice because we want to end up preserving their hard work. We know that properly aligned and balanced rotating equipment is going to last longer. I don't know if there's any disputing that, right? So who likes to go back and fix something they just fixed two weeks ago, six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, because a bearing burnt out, because it wasn't properly aligned, lubricated, balanced? Nobody. And we can help preserve their work through these predictive technologies, but it's not telling them how to do their job. It's an enhancement. It's getting them a little bit better than where they were. So I was not too far from here. Uh, when I was a consultant, I was in Rockford, Illinois at a grease manufacturing plant. And after we got past the pleasantries with the plant manager and the maintenance manager, they took us down to the shop floor. And this is a big indoor tank farm uh, where they have these huge, massive kettles, 70,000 pounds of grease at a time, double agitators, top and bottom, really huge operation. And at the bottom of each one of these tanks is a transfer pump positive displacement, motor, gearbox, pump, right? Slow spinning, 1,100 RPM or so. He said, we want to introduce you to our lead mechanic. This guy can rebuild one of these pumps in under two hours. Saves the day all the time. And I thought to myself, no one at this plant should be that good at rebuilding those pumps. They shouldn't fail that often that you have the expert, the world's expert in rebuilding these positive displacement pumps. So when we say we want to reduce your workload, we want to reduce your firefighting, what that shop floor is hearing is this. Hey, we want your help in taking away your overtime. We want you to help us strip you of your hero status. We want you to show us how we can reduce headcount. And basically, we want you to render yourself useless. This is what they hear if we don't position it correctly. This is what the shop floor hears. And we need to make sure that's not how it comes across. Right? Because we want to mentor this. We want to mentor them. We want to mentor through the prism of technology. Right? We want to show them that we're going to give them superhuman senses, right? Superhuman eyesight with infrared, superhuman touch with vibration, superhuman hearing with ultrasonics, right? It's not telling them how to do their job, it's making them a little bit better than their five senses. Because there's a big gap when you talk about good condition versus bad condition. Right? So to that mechanic that's standing there with the screwdriver on his ear telling me that it's fine, hey, I'm not going to discount the screwdriver. I've done it. It, it. it doesn't not work. But I've got a $40,000 piece of equipment strapped around my neck that might be a little bit more reliable and accurate than the screwdriver. Right? So we just need to let, have that come across gently so that we're removing some opinions on what's good versus what's bad. Right? We want to get technology into their hands. We want to show them, hey, after you've already done something, why don't we collect some vibration data? Why don't I show you how to do that? Or why don't I show you how to log into our online system so you can see, did I make it worse? 
Did I make it better? Did it stay the same? Did it have any impact? Get them thinking along the lines of good or bad through the prism of these predictive technologies. And that heroes come in many forms. Finding a bearing when there's no visual defect, but we know that we've picked up something on the vibration report, that should be celebrated. That needs to be celebrated. That needs to be you know, held in the same regard as the guy that gets the line back up so you can meet quota and ship on time, right? And we also need to show that getting out of that reactive world, there's a path to more value-add work. Maybe we're taking in contractor work that we normally send out. You know, maybe everyone's not burned out on overtime. I know you got some overtime people that love it, but no one wants to be burned out, right? So we need to manage their expectations. Uh, so that they're not thinking this is just another flavor of the week, headcount reduction management thing. This is something to make them legitimately better. <clears throat> so then we move on to management. Whether directly or indirectly, management tells us exactly what is important to the company. We see where they spend their money. We see how they react to certain things, what gets the plant manager's attention, what gets corporate's attention. They tell us what's important. And in turn, we also understand what equipment is important to support these goals. Right? We do asset criticality and we get their input from a financial standpoint, from an environmental health and safety standpoint. They tell us what equipment we should be focusing on. And the value we return needs to be actionable data. Right? We can't raise the red flag for every little blip it needs to be actionable. It needs to be information that they're going to be using to make business decisions, right? Because it's all about risk management, but you can't manage the risk if you haven't identified it. So we can't be chicken little running around saying the sky is falling over every little thing. We need to understand the way that we're talking to them, these conversations that we're having, and that it's received properly. So when if anyone is familiar with uh, CSI, Emerson, uh, Machinery Health Manager, this is a graph of vibration data, right? So you have your time waveform on the bottom, that's our raw data, our FFT in the middle, and then the top line is the overall trend. I would never show management the bottom two graphs because it would take six weeks for them to understand exactly what the squiggly lines mean, right? But they can understand in 30 seconds that our x-axis is time, our y-axis is vibration. Vibration is bad, it's going up, that must be bad, right? So we need to understand how we're communicating to them. If we start saying, oh, well, you know, the velocity spectrum and the acceleration, time, waveform, impact, they've already stopped listening to us. If they're still standing in front of you, it's just because they're trying to be nice. I'm telling you. But they can understand the overall, and that's what we need to communicate. We need to understand how our words are received. Um, when you talk about communication, right, we say things that we understand, but are we saying things that other people in these key roles understand? And again, we, mont we, 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 we mentor through the prism of technology, right? We let them know what they need to know about the technology. Letting them, you know, giving them a severity chart on infrared readings of 8 to 12 degrees over ambient temperature and this, that. No, 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 it's getting hot and it's hotter than it was, and it's off the charts. You know, that, those are the words that we need to let them know. Uh, there was a CEO that came out and said, you know, my job is distilled down to risk management, risk mitigation. And you can't do that without risk identification. And that's really what we're trying to do with these predictive technologies, is that we're trying to identify work that needs to be done. We're identifying risks. And if we do a very good job, we're identifying very low priority risks because we're catching them so early uh, if you were to visualize that PF curve. Um, so we need to get them on board with fixing things and spending money on low priority things, which to them, if you're in a very reactive situation, well, that's not hurting me today. Well, it's going to be tomorrow's fire. It's going to be next week's fire uh, that you're going to have to fight. So being able to communicate the importance of doing proactive work is critical. Right, because then we have to manage management's expectations. Because even when you get FaceTime with some decision makers, what do they want to know? When's it going to fail? 
Well, I can't tell you that. So why do you call it predictive maintenance? If you can't tell me when it's going to fail, you're not really predicting anything. It's kind of why we start calling it condition monitoring, so I guess to maybe to make those conversations a little bit easier. Um, at the end of the day, you need to become valued counsel. We know we have a defect, but we really need to meet our numbers. We really need to get to the next shift. We really need to get to the next week. We need to ship this next batch. What does the vibration say? If your management is saying, what does the vibration say? Well, what was that last temperature reading? That means you become valued counsel, right? But again, we can't be chicken little. We can't say that the sky is falling on every little thing, or else we're just going to be noise. Actionable data delivered to management through these predictive technologies. <coughs> Finance. OK, as maintenance people, this is usually very, very far outside of our realm. Right? We know there's a budget, um, but as Batman is roughing up Robin there, it's not in the budget. And who here knows how to ask for money? Who understands the difference between expense versus capital dollars? Right? All of our hands need to go up. We need to start speaking that language. We need to understand the financial constraints. We need to understand capital project screening criteria, return on investment, internal rate of return. You know, some of these phrases that the finance people speak, we need to fit it into their criteria in order to push these things through. That is the open door. When we just ask for something, that's bumping into a wall, right? We need to talk their talk. We need to understand what their goals are. We need to understand what they're looking for. We need to get onto a one-year, three-year, five-year plan for capital uh, expenditures. We need to fit our projects in that we find through some of these predictive technologies. Right? Because we know that we can deliver documented cost savings. If given the right time, people, training, equipment, this will save money. And finance likes that. They like to save money. Right? And they want to be part of it, too. So here's a sample business case. A continuous improvement initiative led to the use of infrared technology during our VFD and electrical cabinet inspections, saving 15 minutes per asset per inspection. It was done as part of a pilot program in Building 105 over the past 12 months. Since then, the electrical system has not incurred any unexpected downtime stemming from these assets. And in fact, follow-up corrective work orders have increased, incorporating the use of the technology. So we're finding things before they fail. We're fixing things. But it's not going down. It's not impacting. This reduction in labor from the B105 PM optimization pilot amounted to an annualized savings of 3K. Annualized versus one time. Extrapolated out over the remaining electrical assets across the site, there's a potential for an annualized savings of $45,000. To support the scalability, and sustainability of this PM optimization, it's requested that four electricians be trained at a cost of $18.75 per person. Payback period for this investment is less than one year. That's a very, sim a very simple, high-level way to write up, well, why do you want more money? Well, we need to get them trained. Well, we know in principle why we need to train electricians on infrared, because it's such a tremendous tool to them, but why? What does that mean to the finance people? When am I getting my money back? Right? Have you, it, anyone watched Shark Tank? The guys want to know, OK, well, how quickly do I get my money back? What do I get in return? Right? That's what the finance people want to know. What's the value? Right? Because everyone has projects. But if we can put it into such a form that they understand and we're speaking their language and we're supporting their goals, I think we're going to find a lot more open doors than walls. Right? Cost avoidance is a very, very popular topic when we're talking about uh, PDM and the predictive technologies. But it's just the icing, right? It, it, you avoided spending something that wasn't there. It's fabricated to a certain extent. It's theoretical. Uh, maybe you can get them to agree to a percentage of cost avoidance, but it's the icing. It's not the cake. We need to talk about actual hard savings. We need to look at what failures actually cost and how we avoided them. And everyone wants to be part of the winning team. 
right? Get them on board, get them involved, take them through a mechanical room, take them through your tank farm. Hey, this is what we're talking about. Let them see, take them on a gemba walk. Let them see, they probably never put on a hard hat, never walked out into the field. Get them involved, get them part of the winning team, right? In terms of managing expectations, <laughs> They may just be your own, right? You have to manage your own expectations in terms of asking for dollars because you're asking for money, right? And that's tough. That is not an easy thing to do, especially if it's a new purchase, it's a new ask, a new program. You really have to prove your worth, but you need to speak their language in order to do so and expect the uphill battle. So information technology, I saved the best for last. Sometimes we don't even have IT people on our site. They're third party, they're offshore, they're at corporate, they're somewhere else. We never even see them. They're an email address that just says no, right? So when we talk about the value we receive, as we jump into these Internet of Things projects, we can't win, we can't succeed, we can't go forward without IT involvement. And as painful as it is, and I'm speaking from present day experience, they have to be involved early, and they have to be involved often. Because if you have them on board from day one, they can potentially be an ally, and you're networking for future projects. They need to be an ally. So they have goals and objectives too, right? Like any other group. IT, they have goals and objectives. Their objective is not just to say, hey, did you power cycle that? Did you try to turn it off and turn it on again? Right, they have goals and objectives. So hey, can I see your goals and objectives for your group? for this year? Is it to help the business or is it to hurt the business? Is it to enhance, to accelerate? You know, what does that look like? And how do we get on board with helping them achieve their goals through our project? You know, if one of their goals is to uh, incorporate new technology, perfect. I got this all teed up. We got wireless sensors that we want to put in, but somehow we can't figure out how to go about it. Right? And again, the winning team, right? they want to be part of it. Again, take this group through the shop. Take them out into the line. Take them out into the tank farm. Take them somewhere. Put them in a, in a penthouse mechanical room in August and say, hey, it's kind of hot in here. Yeah, I wonder why. Because we don't know that things are going to fail before they do. And it would be really great if we had some wireless sensors. So this is one group where you might also need a translator to even have some of these conversations. <clears throat> I've learned a tremendous amount over the last 12 to 18 months on all different acronyms, and um, that's still my roadmap. I'm still out in left field on a lot of these topics that I let people talk about. But sometimes you need to bring a vendor in because they understand what the sensor or the you know, intent of the system is, and they can interface with your IT folks. right? So, Maybe you don't have to talk it out directly with your IT people. Maybe you could just facilitate it, right? Maybe you just get the, same peop the right people in the room, getting the right data to the right people, finding that connection of what you can and cannot do. What are your company's policies for information security? You know, is there a formal information security review process? What does that look like? Who does it? You know, having a lot of these conversations, this is not maintenance, right? But as we jump into the Internet of Things, it will be how we identify work. It will be the new way we conduct business. And in terms of managing expectations, uh, expect resistance. That's the best, just expect it. It's going to come. Don't take the first no. You know, keep chipping away. Find a way to do a pilot program. Start small, get your foot in the door. Um, and take ownership of it, because if you say, oh, well, this is wireless, it's an IT thing, it's never going to happen. They don't have any vested interest in us identifying you know, motor faults and electrical breaker, you know, elevated temperatures. They, that's not part of what they do. But they're a critical path for us to get it done. So in conclusion, right? so shop floor, it's all about building relationships and leveraging their experience. They have decades of trial and error that we need to capture. We need to get all that information, and we need to help them out. Management, we need to deliver useful, actionable information. We need to be a trusted aid to that valued counsel, not noise. 
valued counsel. I understand what their constraints are and how we can help alleviate the 3 a.m. phone call on a Sunday by some of our programs. Finance, hard savings, support the business goals. If we have alignment to business goals from a financial standpoint, that's an open door. That's somewhere we're going to be able to be able to push our projects through. Uh, and IT, critical path. It's the Internet of Things critical path. If you can't talk it, facilitate it. Just get the right people in the room and let them hash it out, uh, and hopefully you find some headway on there. Create a machine that everyone wants to feed. You're building a brand. You're building a brand. If the plant manager doesn't see you as valued counsel, if he sees you coming down the hall and he just wants to avoid you because you're going to tell him about some insignificant vibration level that's been rising up that he doesn't care about on the bathroom exhaust fan for the third floor, don't waste his time. That's not, that's, you're just creating noise, right? We need to create a brand that everyone wants to feed into. It's critically important. And we mentor and we monetize so that we can be a force multiplier. No one person can do this. No one or two people can do this. But everyone has to get on board because you need the guys on the shop floor seeing things, hearing things, feeding them back to you. You need to be able to have finance say, hey, we got some extra money. Do you have any projects? Do you have any pilots? You need to be on a face-to-face, name-to-name basis with all these people. And it all revolves around having conversations. We need to mentor. We need to monetize this. Right? We need to be marketers, not just maintenance managers. Critically important. And I just want to leave us with one more quote. If there is any one secret of success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. What are we saying? What's our intention? But how is it heard? How is it interpreted? So let's keep that in mind as we go back to our sites and uh, try to make our programs better. That's all I have. Good news is that gives us lots of time for questions. I'm going to have a few too, but I want to make sure the audience has a chance. Uh, microphone. Um, you, oh, you've got the microphone? Go ahead. Uh, that gentleman right there, because he's closest. We'll make sure we alternate sides. Hey, how you doing? Good morning. Um, I was curious. I, I think in your industry in particular, you've got to deal with quality, right? Yes. And, and, and do you go... Do you have a separate conversation for quality, or do you go through management to you know, drive change in GMP? Driving change in GMP. So the quality folks have to be involved every step of the way. Any impact that we make, um, and for those of you not in the, the, the pharma world, you know, good manufacturing practices, um, heavily regulated areas where you, know, you can't change out a motor that's a different model without going through change management in some aspect. Uh, everything has to be the same because you're working within a validated system that was validated one way. When you deviate, there's a lot of paperwork. Um, so when you do want to change things, you do have to involve the quality folks. And you need to have them rest, rest assured. We're just, most of the time, we're just monitoring. There's an air gap between a lot of these systems. Um, and put them at ease, but also don't keep them in the dark. Um, they have to be involved, too, if quality is a factor. Get one on that side. We'll move back to this side. So we're in the farmer world with you. Um, <clears throat> as far as GMP decisions go, are you using this to make a GMP decision, or are you just using this as a monitoring tool? Because like, what we use our vibration analysis and oil analysis and predictive monitoring, um, process monitoring for, we just we're we're writing it so it kind of keeps it out of that quality space and kind of wanted your take on that. So we've ventured into the world of monitoring. In terms of making decisions on quality, that's not something that we, you know, I'm a facility guy. So um, in a lot of the areas that I work in, there's a yellow line and there's GMP and non-GMP. Um, the bulk of my experience is with the non-GMP side, so delivering the the air, the chilled water, the steam, you know, central utilities um, is more where I'm at. Um, but we do interface. So, I mean, 
we, 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 we take it right up to that yellow line. Um, where we have had success is in calling it a monitoring system. That it's, there's, there's no control element to it uh, in a lot of the cases. Um, so we're not impacting their validated system. Oh, microphone. Uh, we used uh, some predictive tools, uh, oil sampling, IR, um, things like that. When we bring new systems in or have people come in, a lot of the sales guys want us to get certified. Is there a, is there a case to get certified or not? Is the benefit for it? Because it's a lot of money to get a guy certified, and what does that actually get us? We, we're in the regulatory, um, but I don't know. It, to me, I, I can't make up my mind if we should send guys to get certified or not. Yeah, so I think there's a big thing we need to understand there's there's certified and then there's qualified and those two things are very very different um, but I think the path to becoming qualified a lot of times starts with a certification so there's a lot of great uh, certifying bodies out there Tech Associates of Charlotte they do a great job Mobius Institute does a great job with their um, online learning for vibration um, I think you do have to venture out side of your four walls to get some industry knowledge to be able to bring back and a lot of times that does run through the certification path um, as long as you're going after a good body a good recognized name and the, and the guys are going to get good training and they're going to bring that back and they're going to you know not let that dwindle because it is a perishable skill um, I think there can be a, a lot of value add for investing in the right person Are you reducing your manpower? That's not the intent. So you're spending money to do more vibration, but you're not reducing your manpower. So if I'm talking about my world, we have a lot of contractors. And it would be cost effective for us to do a lot of this work in-house versus contract it out. Uh, without being so reactive, we're going to have the ability to do so. Uh, it's never the intent to reduce manpower. We may not replace someone that leaves, so through attrition, we may not be replacing, but we are not, it's never our intention to get rid of someone. We have more than enough work. So how do I sell that to my management? How do I go to my management and go, I wanna add more vibes, it's gonna cost you more money, I'm not gonna reduce your manpower. And You're not how do I, labor. Right, I'm not reducing the labor, so, so how do I sell that? You sell that, by talking to what they count, right? Looking at all attributes of that maintenance budget. <clears throat> spare parts, uh, spare parts that you house, spare parts that you spend on an annualized basis. Um, look at the secondary damage that a, that a failure potentially causes and then downtime. You know, we wanna reduce variation, right? That's the whole concept of uh, Six Sigma and just to reduce the variability. We want a smooth, easy going. We want to see things on the horizon, not right when they're in our face. Uh, and being able to, to have that foresight into the future of what's coming down the pike when you have a good vibration program, per se, uh, when you can pick up defects when they're stage one, stage two bearing failures, not stage three, stage four. I can hear it, I can smell it. Um, it peace of mind is tough to quantify but it's a quality I think every manager is looking for. I'm gonna add a piece to that. It actually leads into one of my questions, but uh, um, I'm gonna skip the question, just make a, a comment. I'm sorry, like I said, my voice is not quite there. <laughs> In any case, um, have you tried tying your program to things like energy costs and throughput? I'll give you an example. The, the Department of Energy knows that just the implementation of a program drops energy costs by about 14%, and that's a budget item. The, um, at the National Institutes of Health, when we implemented a maintenance program for purely reactive in just the chiller plant, we took um, and more than halved, by the way, tax dollars, halved the energy budget just by performing basic maintenance, and we're driving it down even further, which that then allowed us to invest in things like uh, absorption tanks. We've got, we just installed two um, five million gallon absorption tanks to again drive costs down even more. Um, 
We, uh, we have now looked at the ability to remove defective equipment because we went from having to run 10 4,000 and 4,500 horsepower chillers to three um, to take care of in the worst case in the summer. They had started out with six. They had added six more, but just by doing things like cleaning tubes and things like that. Boilers, we dropped the number of boilers required down to one from five, um, things like that. So there are things that what we do impact, and if you can take that point and tie it to it, like, uh, sorry, I'm going on, but an example, uh, I, you're going to hear a lot of this stuff this afternoon, so I won't, I'll just give one more example. I just came from one where they were having problem with belt tensioning, and we were able to show 150 horsepower motor reduction to 24 horsepower just by proper belt tensioning. That translated to $6,600 a year in energy costs, let alone all of the other stuff. So often we have to think outside the box. We don't think that we have a direct tie to the budget items. We do. So, sorry, I went on. No, and, 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 <laughs> and that's a great point, especially when we start getting into uh, Internet of Things and you start getting all this data in you know, maybe almost real time. Uh, one of the things we're looking at is asset utilization rate to where you have pump A and pump B, or fan A and fan B that's, that's running. You know, we see instances where we have two fans that are running at 32 hertz each, serving a common plenum. So they're supplying air to the same space, they're both running at 32 hertz, they're both off their best efficiency point. Maybe one of them can run at 45 or 47 hertz and be able to, to meet set point. You know, so then we're turning that off. But then we're also looking at things where we can identify hidden failures or the risk of hidden failures, where you do have pump A and pump B. Pump A has been running for four years. Pump B has never been turned on. Is it really an inline spare if you don't know if it actually works? So being able to balance that and do a equipment switching and have that brought to your forefront when you haven't had your rotating equipment rotating. We have more time for questions, so there you go. So Shane, thank you for a great presentation. I uh, really enjoy the part of, uh, about change management and, uh, and the points you make there. Uh, one of the points you made was about uh, the guys who are really uh, uh, helping me uh, reduce my overtime. And, and that's a, a very important item that we see everywhere. And those guys have a tendency to hide, to, to, be, to be really sneakers so that they, and, and they will put barriers everywhere. So could you share your experience in, in addressing that and overcoming that? Yeah, fire them. Fire them. If you have people that are letting failures live without bringing them up, fire them. Get them out of your organization. If you over rely on a hero to come in and save the day because they have the most knowledge over the steam system in the north side of this plant, and it, it's so finicky and only this person, great, fire them. Over-reliance, it, it's, it's a bottleneck, it's a single point of failure. If, if you have people that just sandbag their morning and afternoon to hopefully get onto overtime on second shift, get rid of them. You know, it's really hard to motivate people to, to get on board with this. So hire motivated people. Then you don't have to do that. Yeah, so I was... Thank easier you. said than done, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to fire everybody. But, um, so one thing I was thinking about, just a selling point for this when you're dealing with management, would be around safety. So um, as, you're, as you're talking through how we're saving money, like uh, a big thing at our facility is, is safety. So if you can tie that aspect into it, as you're communicating this to, to management, to the finance, to everybody else, um, that's a really good selling point for that. Completely agree. Some of the best coattails to ride I am going to are let safety. You, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Society for Maintenance or Liability Professionals, we signed an agreement with OSHA last year. We are working on that very measurement that OSHA is going to use. So we are looking at the direct tie between reliability and safety as a measurable number. Yeah, Ron Moore did some study in one of his books. I remember seeing it. It's it's directly proportional, yep. and they're some of the best coattails to ride. Absolutely. 
What Dinesh? What percentage of equipment in your plant has the predictive maintenance capability? And uh, where are you percentage-wise on the asset health, um, you know, program that uh, that you are implementing? That's proprietary. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so we are re-looking at asset criticality. And we're re-looking at it because that line in the sand of what gets PDM and what doesn't get PDM is shifting. And it's shifting because, first off, we have a lot of construction going on. So our, our, our plant is fluid and it's changing and we need to change proportionally. But it's also changing because the barrier, to, the barrier to entry on a PDM program used to be very high. So you can only do certain assets, only your most critical. With the Internet of Things, you know, you can buy a wireless vibration sensor for $400. Uh, I can really make a good business case to place them just about everywhere. So uh, percentage-wise, it's going up. Utilizing this is definitely going up. And we're recouping some of those costs on PM optimization. I don't need to send someone out there every six months to do a visual inspection when the sensor is giving me vibration and temperature every three hours. Um, so you kind of run into this run to failure, but I'm also going to monitor it. So it's more of a hybrid approach, not so much uh, strict silos in terms of your maintenance strategy. And are you looking at a uh, possibility of buying new equipment with smart sensors and you know already built in, so it's easier instead of going back and retrofitting and all that? System integration. It, it, it has to be easy because there's a cost to it. So creating those digital handshakes, if it's seamless, I don't see why we wouldn't. But if, it's, if, it's, if, that, if, if we need to hire system integrators in order to do that, that's another cost item that we're going to have to overcome uh, in terms of our return. So, okay. Thank okay. you. I'm going to have to keep this on track. Um, you're not leaving today, right? No. So okay. I'll be here for the Perfect. rest of the day. Yeah. Well, you and I got some stuff to talk about. Too. Okay. <laughs>